Hello BNG 426 class. Welcome to the pre-lecture for the flipped classroom activity that's going to take place on Friday. Uh, we are obviously going to be working on metabolic flux analysis as we have been discussing this all week. So let's get started. First some things you already knew um, but I will tell them to you again. The metabolic flux analysis, at least the purpose of it, uh, is you measure the inputs and the outputs uh, of your system. More accurately, we would run a fermentation or some other microbial culture and measure the um, carbon source being taken in and the products coming out of the cells. So we have measured fluxes to start with, and with those measured fluxes, we use that knowledge of those and the metabolic pathways, stoichiometry, etc., to calculate the carbon flux through these pathways. And a lot of times we're doing something called metabolic flux balancing, which is we are examining the stoichiometry of the reactions in the metabolic network. We perform a fermentation, we get the measured fluxes, uh, we set up a constraint-based model uh, which will have our general equation of measured stoichiometry coefficients and fluxes and the ones that we're going to calculate and we'll have constraints like irreversibility, measured fluxes, what, whatever they are, and the metabolic capability of whatever cells we're working with. And from there we do all our matrix math and we can hopefully put together a system that shows all the calculated fluxes that gives us some idea, hopefully an accurate idea, of the carbon going from one node to the next, from one intermediate, one metabolic intermediate, to the next. <clears throat> so we will be examining data from a published work. Here is this published work here. It's from Biotechnology Progress. It is Metabolic Carbon Fluxes and Biosynthesis of Polyhydroxyalkanoids in Ralstonia Eutropha on short chain fatty acids. And this is by U and C from University of Hawaii. What these authors do is they examine metabolic reaction networks consisting of and not limited to the TCA cycle, uh, glyoxylate cycle, the gluconeogenesis pathway, and C3, C4 short chain organic acid catabolic pathways, and the polyhydroxyalkanoid biosynthesis pathway. So why do this? Why even put together a model like this to begin with? Well, the reason for this is that the provision of short-chain acids, mixed short-chain acids, like acetic acid, propionic acid, butyric acid, are advantageous to make, uh, at least for Ralston eutropha, a PHA, a polyhydroxyalkanoid copolymer. And these organic acids can often come from waste streams, so municipal waste, um, could be industrial waste, could be um, agricultural waste, but these acids can come from that if we treat the waste streams in the proper way. Uh, so we can use this waste treated and as a carbon source to make useful biodegradable plastic. So what was done? What did the authors do? They, ha they looked at 41 different reactions. Uh, and those reactions encompassed 40 metabolites. <clears throat> Fed batch culture was used to obtain the measured fluxes that they considered. And then they did vector manipulation. And this is pretty much straight out of their materials and methods of the paper, where they have this vector um, equation, uh, where x equals ar. x they're calling a vector of 41 dimensions. Uh, they don't specify what it is more than that. One can assume it's a vector of unknowns, I, I guess, but probably not considering the um, equation below. Bottom line is it's unknown to us. Um, and A, we do know, is the vector of co stoichiometric coefficients. And this is a matrix of uh, 41 by 41. And R is presumably, though they don't say it, is the vector of rates. And that's 41 dimensions itself. So this vector r is probably going to give us the rates that we need for uh, 
determining the um, metabolic flux through these pathways that they're interested in. They're solving for R in this way, so they manipulate the equation above here um, to become this form, which may look familiar to some of you um, that uh, were paying attention in last class. Um, it doesn't quite look like how we've discussed solving problems before. It does look like sort of, not quite, a pseudo inverse of the vector A is being determined. And this would suggest, uh, as we remember from Wednesday's class, an over determined system. That's when we're using the pseudo inverses of the, of the um, vectors. However, the authors mention in the materials and methods of this paper that it is an underdetermined system. Although they don't give any indication of the degrees of freedom, we have 41 reactions and 40 metabolites. It sounds like the degrees of freedom could be one, although we don't know for sure. Uh, and if the degrees of freedom are indeed one, we uh, they've taken more than one measured flux. Um, so it likely would be an overdetermined system if we look at it like that, based on what we know and what we've learned from uh, the Stephanopoulos book. But they are claiming it's an underdetermined system. I don't know. <clears throat> so their measured fluxes are here in this table. Um, so they are looking at um, the fluxes of the different uh, organic acids going in, acetic acid, propionic acid, butyric acid, and you can see that there are two uh, or two different sets uh, for each acid. There are two different sets of data um, culminating into three separate experiments. We're looking at acetic acid um, added with propionic acid, acetic acid added with butyric acid, and propionic acid added with butyric acid. To, and in, in each, the total carbon is uh, 600 C millimoles or millimoles of carbon per liter. Uh, so they're, they're kind of in the moles or millimoles of carbon here. Um, they're looking at, as far as outputs, carbon in pHA, uh, the carbon in biomass, and the carbon coming from CO2. Uh, and their overall carbon balance <coughs> is um, closed like as you see here with the PHA, the biomass, and the CO2. So the outputs besides carbon dioxide, there's no measurable excretions. PHA is intracellular of course, and then there's biomass. And they pick a chemical formula for the Ralston eutrophic biomass that they stick to here. So the overall stoichiometry looks like this, and again three different organic acids were examined here, and here are the balances for each. Basically, all that's really changing is the carbon source. Um, but of course, as you know, they add two different acids as carbon sources at once. So there'll be some sort of hybrid uh, stoichiometry in play uh, for, in fact, what is going on in their fermenters here. But the stoichiometry uh, would look similar to this. <clears throat> and with uh, all these flux data, they're able to um, construct a metabolic map with a bunch of different fluxes. We see that we have from like R1 to um, probably R40, maybe even R41. Uh, but all of these fluxes shown here uh, were pretty much calculated. Um, and you will be dealing with some of these calculations as uh, you go through the day on the flip class on Friday. So the assignment, there are actually there are three different assignments because there are three different experiments here uh, put together by the authors uh, in that they have um, two set, a set of two acids, uh, three sets of two acids that they're looking at as carbon source. So there'll be one group will get one assignment, another group will get another, et cetera, et cetera. So there'll be one assignment per group. There'll just be three different assignment sheets uh, depending on what number you choose or what number uh, you have drawn uh, in terms of uh, what your group number is. The examination of organic feeding and resulting carbon fluxes, uh, you'll focus on polyhydroxyalkanoid production. We won't really deal with the gluconeogenesis uh, fluxes, so I don't talk too much about it. <clears throat> but you look at these combinations. 
One group will look at acetate and propionate. One group will look at acetate and butyrate. One group will look at propionate and butyrate. And then, of course, there's going to be more than three groups, so there'll be uh, other groups that are looking at uh, one of these three conditions as well. So you'll answer the questions to learn about the fluxes and the flux splits, which are important in this case, where the carbon is going. Uh, and it goes in different places depending on what acids you're looking at. Uh, and you'll look at the given scenarios. So you, examining these fluxes and these flux splits will tell you which pathways are active or inactive depending on the carbon sources that have been fed to the Ralston eutrophic bacteria. Also, what type of polymer is synthesized by the cells. So there's either polyhydroxybutyrate, which is a traditional uh, homopolymer that's synthesized by Ralston eutrophic cells. So we have uh, our N1 and N2 monomers. This is hydroxybutyrate. This is hydroxyvalerate. The um, N2 concentration would be zero if it's polyhydroxybutyrate. And if it's the copolymer, polyhydroxybutyrate, cohydroxyvalerate, the N2 concentration is going to be greater than zero. In the end, it is my hope, and it's my hope we get to this uh, at the end, that you've, you've done almost everything and are in a place to be able to, to say this, that e one representative from each group will end up writing on the board uh, what raw stony eutroph was fed, what organic acid combination it was, and what percentage, uh, what monomer percentage PHA was produced. So P mole percentage uh, hydroxybutyrate co mole percentage hydroxybutyrate was produced. And we will compare and contrast results based on what combination of carbon sources were fed. We may not reach that. I'm hoping we do. Um, so, but let's just strive to do that. So I will see you all on Friday. And if you have any questions in the meantime, in the interim, uh, please feel free to contact me by email or swing by my office. Thank you.